the bank has assisted in various ways for many years, but we are especially pleased to be the major supporting partner of the Sir Arthur Lewis Memorial Lecture for three main reasons. Firstly, Sir Arthur's life, work, and legacy, acknowledged by the greatest of his contemporaries, as well as subsequent generations of both ac academics and practitioners in the field of development, stand out as a beacon to everyone, young and old, who seeks to understand and provide solutions to real problems. We are proud as an indigenous institution and as indigenous institutions must strive to do to support the honoring of his legacy and that of our other Nobel laureate. Secondly, savings and encouraging people and countries to evolve from low savers to high savers as a means of increasing the availability of capital for development form a major plank of his theory of economic growth. He wrote that financial savings institutions must be significant and widespread. In that regard, Sir Arthur's views resonate with us at the bank and our role in mobilizing savings via our network of branches throughout the length and breadth of St. Lucia is in keeping with his thinking. Thirdly, in the guidance and technical advice that the bank provides to people and small businesses, and in the historical contribution that we have made to the educational and professional development of our people, we are in concert with Sir Arthur's enduring words. The fundamental cure for poverty is not money, but knowledge. The words of Professor Paul Mosley and Barbara Ingham in their biography on Sir Arthur, on Sir Arthur's life and work. His life and work truly embody a commitment to development that focuses on the human condition. Bank of St. Lucia is honored to support the 2020 Sir Arthur Lewis Memorial Lecture. We at Bank of St. Lucia, thank you. So I am honored to deliver the 2020 Sir Arthur Lewis Memorial Lecture here in Sir Arthur's homeland. As I understand it, this lecture series is two decades strong and counting. I recognize the impressive list of the illustrious speakers who have preceded me in this series, including Dr. Le Corbinier. Today, tonight, we continue to celebrate Sir Arthur Lewis's legacy as the, most, the Caribbean's most renowned economist for his unmatched contribution to development economics, for which he earned the Nobel Prize in 1979. I wish to acknowledge and thank the Impolite Louise, Chair of the Committee, for a gracious invitation to speak tonight, and as part of this impressive schedule of events in this particular cycle. As again, we continue to remember, celebrate, the towering contributions of St. Lucia's two Nobel laureates, Sir Arthur Lewis and Sir Derek Walcott, on what would have been their 105th and 90th birthdays, respectively. I commend the Imperlet and the Laureate Festival Committee for their diligent service, including the excellent arrangements afforded me for this evening's event. These events do not merely serve as retrospectives to recognize the glorious achievements of St. Lucia's Nobel laureates, as necessary and appropriate as that is but inspire generation and future generations to make our unique contributions to our country and humanity. I wish to dedicate tonight's lecture to the youth of our region and especially the youth of St. Lucia. Far too often, too many of us make the mistake of believing that the youth's time is only in some undefined future. Yet as Alvin Torfell noted futurist and author of the widely acclaimed books, Future Shock and the Third Wave asserts, and I quote, the secret message communicated to most young people today 
is that they are not needed. That the society will run itself quite nicely until they, at some distant point in the future, will take over the reins. Yet, the fact is that the society is not running itself nicely. Because the rest of us need all the energy, brains, imagination, and talent that young people can bring down on our, to bear on our difficulties. For society to attempt to solve its desperate problems without the full participation of even very young people is imbecile. End of quote. Now the issue of youth marginalization in our region is real. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today, in many companies, ministries, committees, and even churches, there is a cultural war of sorts between the millennials and the mature with the millennials often labeled as hot and sweaty and in a hurry. The consequence of this is a highly level, high level of disengaged and disaffected youth among both the employed and the unemployed. In tackling the formidable challenges now confronting our Caribbean civilization, we must, of necessity, bring to that enterprise the collective capital of all of our people, but especially the ideas, talent, energy, and urgency of our youth. And if we had any doubt about the capacity of our youth, we have to look no further than the wonderful production by the Arts Club of Sir Arthur Lewis Community College last evening, Style God of Earth. What a performance it was. St. Lucia's youth are capable they simply need opportunity. As someone who has had aspersions cast about my capacity to serve on account of my youthfulness, I offer you, the youth of St. Lucia, that on which I have relied. 1 Timothy 4.12 of the Holy Scriptures, New International Version. Let no one despise your youth. It says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and purity. When I started my journey as a public servant, when I was appointed as a financial secretary in my 20s, late 20s, a headline appeared in a particular newspaper, Rookie Economist Takes Over the Ministry of Finance, suggesting that I had no competence or clue to handle the Ministry of Finance. I remember one gentleman in the ministry came to me and he said, how old are you? Looking at me with some disdain. And he said, I think this work is too big for you. <laughs> Years later, he was man enough to return to me and said, I had my doubts, but you proved to be up to the challenge, worthy of the trust conferred in you. <laughs> Let no one chant you down or put you down. You have the ability to do well for your country and for our region. Here in St. Lucia, 43% of the population is under the age of 30. So I say they are our present and they are our future and the future is now. Ladies and gentlemen, we must toil for a transformed society that some of us may not fully experience, but which our youth, your children and, children and my two daughters, Cherise and Yana, will inherit. I am motivated. So should you. Tonight's lecture is economic transformation by invitation and innovation. It is my considered view that the social democratic model that has served our region has run its course. It is my considered view. Indeed, our forays into citizenship by investment programs international financial services, and of late, medicinal marijuana are our determined attempts to find a niche to carve out a living for us in a hostile global economy. That is what that is about, a search for a new model for survival. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot change our size. We cannot change our history. We cannot change our geography, but we can and must change our trajectory. That is in our hands. I truly believe 
that technology is a great equalizer for small states such as ours. But if we wish to reap the digital dividends of the digital economy, we must embrace, fully embrace, digital transformation. Standing on Sir Arthur's shoulders, I propose to offer some thoughts on a forward-looking development strategy for 2020 and beyond. With due deference to Sir Arthur's contribution, I will briefly revisit his original prescription. I will then recast that strategy with the technological innovation as a key lever in the transformation process. Through the boundless possibilities offered by the fourth industrial revolution, socioeconomic transformation by invitation and innovation could be a much needed impetus for a region's transformation thrust and to help our societies to experience shared and sustainable prosperity. Why do we need transformation? That's an assumption of this, of this talk. Why do we need transformation? In 1950, Sir Arthur published a seminal scholarly piece, The Industrialization of the British West Indies. He did so in the Journal of Caribbean Economic Review. This article birthed the model that would later become popularly known as industrialization by invitation. Interesting fact, Sir Arthur did not give the strategy this catchy tagline. That honor, in fact, goes to another distinguished West Indian scholar, the late Lloyd Best. Indeed, the name was intended as an epithet, an intellectual jab at the model. In, modern, in, in, in best, in a bit of a style. But in any event, it stuck, and the rest is history. As a consequence of the prevailing domestic conditions and constraints, Sir Arthur devised a comprehensive strategy for industrializing Caribbean economies. I know I like the key aspects of his model. One, a customs union. Ever the regionalist, the author saw the creation of a customs union as vital for the successful implementation of an industrial policy for the region. Two, export-oriented manufacturing, led in the first instance by foreign investors with the requisite capital and expertise to develop industry, generate employment, and gain access to international markets. The recommendation was for countries to differentiate their products in order to create niche markets that would allow them to compete internationally. Three, an active role for government. So Otto saw government intervention as necessary for correcting market failure and that because of underinvestment and for creating an enabling business environment for attracting investors. Government's two roles, as outlined by Sir Arthur, were first, establish a development agency to lead the charge in attracting investment, Second, to wield fiscal policy as an instrument by offering fiscal incentives. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, in a nutshell. Now, you wrote a lot more than that, but that's it in a nutshell. Now, fast forward 70 years. How do current conditions compare with when industrialization by invitation was first presented? Here's a quick summary. Some of you may be able to see this. So 1950, when Sir Arthur published, 2020, 70 years later. At that time, we were low-income countries. We are now considered middle-income and, in some cases, high-income countries. Check. Progress. Small domestic markets. Guess what? Still small domestic markets. High levels of unemployment. Guess what? Still high levels of unemployment. Low labor productivity. Guess what? Low labor productivity. Productivity is the lowest it's been in the last 30 years in this region. You better believe that. Large pool of low skilled labor. Today, skills mismatch. So here you have juxtaposed with high unemployment, you still have critical skills shortages in some of our countries. And we are still importing labor for certain, for certain skills or for certain services because they are not available. Large agricultural sector, 
Then, today, large services sector, tourism being our dominant sector, and its allied services. Then, relatively low labor costs, now relatively high labor costs. So you see the situation? Productivity has been going this way, labor cost is going that way. You see the conundrum? And you'll see in a minute why our growth is constrained and why it has been constrained for a long period of time. Domestic savings, and Dr. Corbinet, the, the Corbinet mentioned it. Low levels of domestic savings. Then, what do we have now? High level of liquidity, but constraints to access to credit. As we speak in the ECCU, there are deposits that come for a total of about $21 billion. And yet, there has been for a long time a situation of X excess liquidity, which simply means deposits are rising faster than loans and the banks are not finding appropriate opportunities to lend money. Unless you beat up on the banks, which is the favorite pastime of some, and the banks, of course, at times do deserve some blows, we must accept that too. But not all, not all. I have to defend the banks as well. The banks are facing high non-performing loans. And that has a drag on credit and access to credit. But worse is the fact that we simply do not have a sound credit ecosystem in this region. What should happen is savers should be able to find a way, the money should be able to get to investors and borrowers. We do not have a credit bureau. We do not have a partial credit guarantee scheme. We still are struggling with respect to collateral in 2020. Those are some of the obstacles that are impeding our growth. But I run ahead of myself. Let me get back on point. Low levels of domestic expertise. We have today an entrepreneurial class that's emerging, and especially uh, small businesses, uh, many of which are locally owned. And that's a good thing. But there are challenges there because they too are facing the issue of lack of access to credit. They too are facing the issue of long delays on their receivables. Do you think about a small business trying to make ends meet and they have to wait 60 or 90 or sometimes 180 days to get their money? How are they going to survive? How are they going to survive? Many of them with great ideas and good services are struggling because there is a difficulty where that is concerned. Now, in an effective credit system, there ought to be a way for them to be provided with liquidity. Whether that means factoring, for example, where somebody buys the receivables, give them the cash flow, so they could continue to do the business. These things are holding us back. And when I speak about the credit bureau, I want you to understand the context for why this is important and why we need to get on with the business. Low levels of debt today, high levels of debt. And on top of that, the existential threat of climate change. So evidently, by the way, when I went on that list, I think I only had two correct. How many did you get? How many did you get? One. So we've made some progress over those 70 years. But we have not made as much progress as we ought to. And the last couple of decades have been disappointing. Against this backdrop, I assert that we absolutely need socioeconomic transformation. And to support this assertion further, I now offer you five, six exhibits, a mere sampling of the big problems confronting the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. And we'll do this quickly. Exhibit number one, high debt, low growth trap. That red line there is 60%. Most of our countries have been above that and have been above that for well over, for almost 20 years. You go back to 2000 when we started, many of the countries were there. St. Lucia is in the light blue. St. Lucia was under, and of course, at some point in time, uh, St. Lucia went over 60. The bottom line is that these high levels of debt are creating a drag on the economy. They're weighing us down, holding us back. The Monetary Council has set a target of 60% by 2030. At this moment, St. Kitts and Nevis has met that target. 
And Grenada is on course to hit that target, possibly end of this year and certainly by next year. Now take a look at this. You may not be able to see this, but what this shows you is that not since the 1980s. So remember the target for growth in our region is 5%. That's our target approved by the Monetary Council, finance ministers, most of whom are prime ministers. 5%. Not since the 1980s have we hit that target when we were averaging 6%. And if you look at the dark blue line, which is the ECCU, St. Lucia is the light blue, you will see that that line has come down and down and down. And it coincides with the loss of preferential access, sugar and bananas. It coincides with countries that are contracting more debt. It coincides with loss of concessional financing as we graduated from low income to middle income. And it also coincides with some fiscal profligacy. And we have to acknowledge that at times the governments have not being on their best behavior where fiscal matters are concerned. Then we had the global financial crisis. But notice there, if you can see on the screen, that St. Lucia, and this is important, we are in St. Lucia, for the last two decades, the growth in St. Lucia is actually below the average of the ECCU. So whereas in the first few years, the first couple of decades, St. Lucia was higher than, the light blue is higher than the dark blue, What's what happens there? If you look in the last two decades, it's actually below. In fact, if you look at the number, what you will see is in 2000 to 2009, the ECCU average 2.7, St. Lucia average 2%. And then in the last decade, the ECCU average 1.6%, St. Lucia average 1.2%. Some of you may ask, well, why is that? Well, perhaps you can say better than I can. You live here. But that several factors, and I want to mention four. There are other factors, of course. Low and declining productivity. Go to the National Productivity Council, you will see the information there. I won't go into that now. Limited fiscal space, which has constrained the size of the government's capital program. A fundamental thing in public finance is this. And Director of Finance, good evening, I want to acknowledge you. The recurrent expenditure keeps you going the capital keeps you growing. If your capital is constrained, it fundamentally constrains the growth capacity of the country. It's like you're telling the teachers, all we could do is pay your salaries, but we can't give you chalk to teach. Or we can't give you the materials to teach. So all we could manage is the recurrent expenditure. I'm not saying this is the case here in St. Lucia. I'm simply giving an example <laughs> of what happens when all you can do is recurrent expenditure. And I speak from personal experience. I was a financial secretary for 14 years. So I saw that in Grenada. I'm not, you know, I know that. That's a reality that I lived. Also, inordinate delays in the completing of major projects, even when there is secured external financing. And the fourth one I'll mention is slow, painfully slow implementation of structural reforms including legislative reforms to address the issues of access to credit. Those are four reasons. There are others. Four reasons why you've seen the underperformance in the last 20 years. In the case of the latter, the access to credit, the private sector is hurt. The small businesses are hurt when they do not have that access. Credit is the oxygen that keeps these economies going. And as we enter this new decade, there is an urgent need to arrest and reverse this trend. Let's move on to our next exhibit. High unemployment, particularly among our youth. And here you see uh, Grenada and St. Lucia. Grenada is in the yellow, St. Lucia is in the blue. The good news is that unemployment is falling in both countries. In the case of St. Lucia, it's down to, I believe, around... 17% uh, thereabouts, um, if I um, stand corrected there, I'm just trying to get my note there, but it's been trending down, um, Grenada is also trending down, but Grenada is higher, and typically, youth unemployment doubles the national average, so if the national average is 15%, youth is 30%, now I would love to have put up more of our countries, but here's the thing, Grenada and St. Lucia and Grenada are the only countries that consistently do labor force service. St. Lucia does it quarterly, Grenada does it annually. 
And we are trying to encourage more of our countries to publish what is a very important socioeconomic statistic. So that's all we can offer you at this moment. Undoubtedly, the most dominant socioeconomic challenge of our time is high unemployment, especially among our youth. The injustice of unemployment is that it deprives willing individuals of the dignity of decent work and the opportunity to fully participate in economic life. Exhibit number three, persistent levels of poverty. And if you notice, poverty uh, has come down in St. Lucia. Uh, it was 28.8% in 2006. It's now, it was 25% in 2016. And that's based on the CDB poverty assessment uh, that was done. But poverty is still high in our region. We have pockets of poverty that are quite high in some parts of, in some parts of our, our region, in some of our countries. Next ex exhibit, the doing business. Of 190 economies ranked by the World Bank, the ECCU ranking is 121. St. Lucia fares the best of the six ranked member countries. But still, at 93, it's far below our target of being in the top 50. What explains these low rankings? The next exhibit shows you. What does it show you? That the key areas where we have a difficulty are access to credit. Access to credit. What's our ranking there? What's our ranking there? 161 out of 190 countries in the world. That is pulling down the ranking. An international investor, an international investor who does not know this country or the region, one of the first things that they pick up is the, this report to get a sense. So I know some of us have difficulty with some of the methodology in this report, but the truth is that it is a headline indicator often relied on by foreign investors. We have to address this issue. Next one. Registering a property, 107, 104, based on the, the, the last um, ranking. And then the other one is resolving insolvency. So I just point out three areas. Were we to ad address these three areas, the ranking would significantly improve. And we would have a fighting chance of breaking into the top 50. But here's the thing. These are relative rankings. And while we take our sweet time to implement reforms, the rest of the role is taking care of business. They are not waiting on us. So we have to be very careful about that. Next exhibit. Crime. High levels of crime. There you see average homicide rates per 100,000 over the last 17 years. And you will see where we are as a region, 14.8 in the region, compare that to North America, 5.5, or compare that to the rest of the world, 6.3. St. Lucia is at 22. Jamaica is at 46.8. Grenada, 9.5. Barbados, 9.4. I don't need to say much more about crime. I think we all recognize it is a major issue. Next exhibit. Climate change. I think we all recognize today that climate change poses an existential threat to our region. In fact, the, the most recent survey by the United Nations Environmental Program declares that emissions need to be cut, we know, by to 1.5 degrees. At the moment, based on trend, we are looking at about 3.2 degrees. The fact of the matter is, if we continue on that trend, many of our countries, or at least parts thereof, will be underwater well before 2100. And some of you say, well, I wouldn't be around at that time. But don't be so cynical. How many of you remember Y2K? Y2K? Anybody remembers? Well, that was 20 years ago. So long ago. The point is time quickly. We've entered a new decade, and before you know it, we'll be at 2030, and then these things will begin to bite. We have to address this issue of climate change. So confronted with the weight of this evidence, 
these exhibits which you have just seen, I wish to believe that we all recognize that transformation is essential and we must join hands to make that happen in our region. Industrialization by invitation 70 years on. The introduction of citizenship by investment programs has become the second generation of our region's invitation strategy as our countries grapple with the challenge of securing foreign investment of revenue to address rising development needs. Since 1984, starting in St. Kitts and Nevis, followed by the Commonwealth of Dominica, and more recently, Antigua and Barbuda, Grenada, and St. Lucia, our industrialization model has been dominated by CBI. In a sense, CBI has become the second generation of IBM. So whereas before it was come and we give you incentives, pay a fee and we give you citizenship or a passport. Now I recognize this is a high controversial issue for some. Deep, strong philosophical views among many. But at the end of the day, countries have their sovereign right to exercise. Today, the CBI is the dominant vehicle for foreign direct investment in our countries. Indeed, over the past 10 years, CBI has contributed more than $3.6 billion to the ECCU. And here you can see back $3.9 billion. And if you look there, you will see what the countries are doing. So if you look for St. Lucia, you will see that St. Lucia came in on average, over the last three years, at about 31.1 million. But you look, for example, at St. Kitts, and you'll see that it came in at 192.3 million. Of course, St. Lucia, St. Kitts has the oldest and largest CBI program. Significant resources. And that is only what is accounted for in the government coffers. Because many of them, as you know, have real estate components. And the real estate component does not go to the treasury. They invest in a, an approved project, whether that is a hotel, a manufacturing plant, an agro processing plant, whatever um, that is approved. So the point is, CBI has brought in significant resources. These policies are used for several purposes, including hotels, infrastructure, social programs, and in some cases, even salaries. The program has delivered considerable benefits to our countries. You look at the roads, for example, in St. Kitts and Nevis, and St. Kitts in particular, and there's no question that CBI has helped. And in the case of Dominica, CBI has been a lifeline for Dominica in the aftermath of the devastation caused wrought by Hurricane Maria. That said, CBI programs are accompanied by significant risk, and their future is far from certain. CBI programs, like their predecessors, the fiscal incentives, have been subjected to strong competitive pressures. Fees have been slashed as jurisdictions compete to attract foreign investors, leading to a race to the bottom. The programs have also become under increased scrutiny in light of news reports with allegations of corruption and abuse. So what can the ECCU do to mitigate these risks? given the importance of these programs in terms of foreign exchange, government revenue, and economic activity. I will return to that in the next section, which is my last section. Transformation by innovation, the next 70 years. In the concluding paragraph of the 1950 paper, Sir Arthur made an astute observation that some key is needed to open the door behind which the dynamic energies of the West Indian people are at present confined. End of quote. I submit to you that innovation made possible by the rapidly unfolding fourth industrial revolution could be that key which unlocks our region's growth potential. In this regard, I welcome St. Lucia's plans to develop an innovation policy as part of its broader agenda for a decade of research and innovation, as announced uh, recently. The fourth industrial revolution, whose collection of innovations 
has been characterized by the World Economic Forum as a range of new technologies that are fusing the physical, digital, and biological worlds, impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries. Now, the World Economic Forum and McKinsey have collaborated on a lighthouse, lighthouse project which documents the applications of technology in firms, and the results and the findings have been impressive. And so the question is, how can we build lighthouses in the ECCU, St. Lucia, and the countries of the ECCU? How can we build lighthouses using the fourth industrial revolution technologies? How can we create lighthouses here and change our trajectory and transform our economies and our situation? That transformation requires fundamental changes. Disruption of the old way of doing things across sectors, be they public sector, agriculture, manufacturing, and of course tourism. And by the way, the contrary to popular belief, so Arthur's model did not marginalize, marginalize the agriculture sector. The sector remains vital for ensuring our region's food security. And I've been on record as saying that my hope would be that as Guyana explores its newfound riches, we would find a way at a regional level to pursue a national or regional food security program that assures us of food. We've seen experiences in the last few years, including last year with the hurricane. One hurricane and in one week, supermarkets, no, no food. Ships can't come in. One week. We have to address that issue. And so food security is something that we must not overlook. And technology can help with that. And that's the point. So when we talk about technology and digital transformation, we're not leaving our culture behind. A guy who is fishing ought to be able to fish, use his smartphone and take a picture of the fish while still on the ocean, have that sent, uploaded and sent, so that by the time he reaches the shore, that is already sold and the money is in his account. That is the appropriate use of technology for the fisherman. So my point is that technology can enable all sectors. So this, this nonsense narrative that we somehow leave in our culture behind, that's not true. That's a nonsense narrative. Technology can enable all sectors, all sectors, to be transformed and to new business models to emerge if we are ready to embrace its potential. What we have found, and the research from ECCB shows, is that if we implemented these reforms, our economic trajectory will increase. Right now, we're averaging around 3.3%, 3.4%. If we implemented these reforms, including the credit bureau, including the partial credit guarantee scheme, including the doing business things that I talked about, including some of the things we have to do in our labor markets, and I'm going to talk about a few others in a moment, we can immediately, in short order, I should say, not immediately, short order, raise our trajectory to almost 5%. So there are things that we can do. We don't control the global economy. We can't control what will go on in the US. But we can certainly control our response to the opportunities before us. And we have to do that. So with this imperative in mind, I want to finish this talk by offering some thoughts on the way forward. Here are some of our views. Governance. Political governance. Yes, I must talk about that. Because the importance of governance for sustained development cannot be overestimated. The necessity for the implementation of reforms is often determined by political economy considerations. I'm a lowly economist, but at least that I do understand. Having worked in the public service for a long time as financial secretary, and of course now as governor of the central bank. On this complicated issue, I wish to make one observation. Our current electoral model, which results in a winner-take-all outcome, is not in the best interest of our small countries. Wow, it seems to have touched a nerve there. It has the unintended effect 
of alienating large segments of population. This is a luxury we can ill afford as we seek to raise productivity and shared prosperity. Furthermore, this electoral model does not provide incentives for bipartisan approaches to resolving our most intractable problems. We have situations where politicians on either side of the aisle telling you, yes, they believe and support a particular policy, but they cannot publicly go and take that position because they'll be lynched by their supporters. It's a perverse arrangement that we are still using constitutional masters. It's an indictment, grave indictment on all of us. And indeed, constitutional reform is necessary. Now, I am well cognizant of the fact that three countries in our neighborhood, in the ECCU, have tried and failed, including two with overwhelming majorities and mandates. But that shouldn't discourage us. That simply makes the point that constitutional reform is not possible unless there's a bipartisan approach. So if we want it, we are going to have to come together to do it. Remember what I said? All of the collective energies of our people. Half the population cannot be outside wondering and waiting and moaning and groaning because somehow they feel marginalized. This is a systemic problem. I'm not here to point fingers at any particular party. The truth is that that is a system handed down to us that we must change for our benefit going forward. In the meantime, while we struggle, and development is a struggle, to get to constitutional reform, we could at least strengthen our social partnership framework. That is the coming together of government, opposition, business, labor, civil society, churches, including youth, of course. And in some countries, Jamaica, Grenada, Barbados, they have helped to usher through or push through very key reforms and to manage political considerations. And I'm a strong believer in the need for a strong social partnership. Second, on the governance, is fiscal governance. Establish a fiscal resilience framework inclusive of the enactment of fiscal responsibility legislation. This includes an independent watchdog that reports to Parliament on an annual basis on the performance of government. This is critical. Again, I make no apologies for this. I served as a financial secretary, and I am unapologetic about the need for that. And I'm pleased that one of the things we did before I left my office in Grenada was to get fiscal responsibility legislation through, and so that the FROC, Fiscal Responsibility Oversight Committee, now files annual reports to Parliament. That is one of the main reasons why Grenada has stayed on track even after the IMF program ended. Without that, it could easily have gone up the rails again. So I highly recommend fiscal responsibility legislation. Now, there are those who argue that will constrain them, handcuff them. No government wants to be constrained. They want the flexibility. But I say to you, this is not to constrain you. This is to empower you to manage more effectively, especially in times of downturn. Because what resilience frameworks allow is for a government to pursue counter cyclical fiscal policy. A big word which simply means when things are down, you can only spend. We discovered, I discovered, I enjoyed, went through that. After financial crisis, many of our Russia included, Grenada included, most of them. At a time when the country should have been increasing expenditure to cushion the effect on the population, 
they were cutting expenditure. And they were not cutting expenditure because the government were wicked. They were cutting, ex cutting expenditure because they simply had no fiscal space. They were maxed out where credit was concerned. So you could not go and, and continue to borrow to be able to, to make the expenditure. So this actually is a mechanism to help us better manage in times of downturn. And I strongly, strongly encourage that. I'm pleased to see in St. Lucia that both of the major parties in the manifestos have promised fiscal responsibility legislation. So at least it appears we have back president support on that. Let us see what unfolds. Next, CBI reforms. CBI reforms. In our view, a region required in respect of standard setting pricing. So the ECCB advocates that we have a common standard for diligence. If one country denies an application, another country ought not to approve that application. We're in a single space. So we have to have common standards. It's crucial. It's crucial. We believe also that these funds should be used for building resilient infrastructure, investing in the productive sectors which are starved, including agriculture, and paying down debt. We believe those are... We definitely are not recommending their use for recurrent expenditures such as salaries. And then fiscal incentives reform. And here we simply say increase transparency by publishing all concessions granted to investors. <laughs> Secondly, do less tax holidays and more accumulated depreciation allowance, which simply means that you get the credit when you actually make the investment because what it does, it holds the investor accountable because what happens is that many times, and I've been there, many times they promise you jobs and levels of investment and they do not deliver. So our position is, it is there for you when you make the investment. But this broad 10, 20 years holiday, tying up a set of things and not producing anything, we have to discontinue that. And then, of course, stronger accountability, better monitoring of actual implementation of concessions. You will be shocked, shocked, not just here, all over the region, when you see what was promised and actually what was delivered. And we really have to hold people accountable for that. We want people to come, but we also expect them to deliver. And we have to hold them accountable. Let me move on as I look to wind up. Skills, development, and labor market reforms. Curriculum reform. And I... I want to hail the teachers in the house, the lecturers. Give them a round of applause. They work hard. They typically are underpaid. And I make no comment about St. Lucian teachers. I don't know what their salaries are. But teachers all over the world are typically underpaid. My mom was a master teacher school principal. I have a lot of respect for teachers. And of course, the impolite is herself uh, highly accomplished educator. There must be a deliberate shift from subjects to skills. From subjects to skills. What is the point of getting 20 subjects and you can't find a job? And, or better, or worse yet, you can't create your own job. And what is it, and how it is that on some days you're looking for a good plumber and you can't find one? But we're churning all these people. Bragging rights. The boy bright. The girl bright. We got to change that. The Future of Jobs report makes clear that the future jobs are in areas such as data scientists, robotics, innovation specialists, social media specialists, digital transformation specialists, including media what are you doing? Digital media in a good spot. You're in a good spot. We need more of that. And so we want to encourage the shift to STEM. In that respect, mathematics is very important. What you're teaching? And what we need to do is make sure that our best, best math teachers are used across the country. Technology allows us to do that. 
I can benefit from you. All students can be brought under you and your tutelage and can get their instruction. Rather than have poor results because we have teachers who are not with it in terms of the technology and, the, and, and we and we seen very poor grades in terms of our performances. So I think we could do better there. I am advised that with less than 12 months of training in coding, somebody can be employed and get $2,000 US a month. That's a decent paying job in the ECCU. That's more than double the average household income, which is around 2000 2500 in most of our countries. So what's my point? We need to introduce coding in our primary schools. Primary schools. We also need to encourage coding academies. That's where the demand is. And that's where good paying jobs are. Three, people and business facilitation. And if you're watching your watch, I'm on number three. I'm going to five. Touch your neighbor and say, wake up, he's finishing soon. So the third one is people and business facilitation. 21st century government. It is imperative now that governments take the lead in delivering e-government services. It will free up the public sector, save money, and reduce the frustration that many citizens feel when dealing with government on a day-to-day -day basis. It will also reduce allegations of any suggestions of corruption where people feel that hands have to be greased and encouraged for them to get service. You are a citizen, you are entitled to service. You are not supposed to be paying for a permit to do your favor. That's your entitlement. Unfortunately, because of our bureaucracy, many times you have to know somebody to, you know, that creates a burden, a tax of sorts on the citizen. And therefore, government has to do a lot more where that is concerned. But more important than that, if we want to build out a digital economy in this region, we have to build digital trust. And a key ingredient to do that is the faster adoption of government, by government, of e-government services. So I want to encourage our governments where that is concerned. Digital financial services. Now, many of you have heard of our plan at the ECCB to launch the digital Eastern Caribbean dollar later this year. That, we believe, is fundamental, the digitization of our currency, as we move towards a digital economy. Where are we now? So for the last year, since March, we have been in the development and testing phase. We are nearing the end of that. Thereafter, we are going to go into a period of public education and training our pilot partners. And then we plan to launch the digital dollar in June of this year. So far in St. Lucia, some of our partners who have come on board are Bank of St. Lucia, First National, First Caribbean, St. Lucia Cooperative Credit Union, and Monrepo Credit Union. I believe others are also indicating interest. So I want you to stay tuned. How will it work? Simply put, we'll give you an app, which you download. You go to the App Store, the Google Play Store, you download it, DXTD Carib. It will then link to an account, if you have an account, with a bank or credit union. That's your first option. If you don't have an account, you can use physical cash and bring in and, and switch to digital cash. So we'll have two offerings. The registered model for those who are already in the system and the value-based model for those who have do not have an account. The only difference is that those with a registered model will have higher thresholds or will be able to, to do a lot more transactions in terms of volume because they are already known by the bank. So in terms of anti-money laundering and combating finance and terrorism safeguards, those are already in place because you're already onboarded. With the lower threshold, we will still have to have some safeguards, so we will put a limit on what the size of the transaction can be on a monthly basis. So you can do any number, but within a, an envelope that we'll provide. So the first thing you download and you, you connect. And then after that, you scan and pay using your smart device. And thirdly, you'll get a confirmation of payment, and that happens within seconds. Our value proposition is to deliver the fastest, cheapest, safest payment option 
in our region. Now, there still will be other options available. So we're not saying other payment channels cannot be used, but you will get to decide which ones you want to use and for what purpose. Our hope is that in doing this, among other things, we reduce our use of physical cash and checks, but most importantly, we speed up payments, because I've made the point. We pay too much for payment services in this region. If you're paying 3% for a service, that's too much. If you're paying 5%, that's too much. And then sometimes it takes too long. You're doing a check or you're doing a this and it takes in days. Sometimes it should be T plus one. Sometimes that doesn't happen. So we are delivering something that we believe will touch every person, including the poorest of the poor. Including the poorest of the poor. And that is something that we are working assiduously to deliver. Before I move off this point, I do want to make I do need to say that digital governance is key. So as we build our digital economy, we have to be cognizant of risk, such as cybersecurity and the need for cyber resilience. We have to be conscious of things like data protection. So in this regard, I welcome what ECTEL is doing in respect of a data protection law across the currency union, certainly the five ECTEL member countries, of which St. Lucia is, of course, a member. ECTEL is headquarters here, to be able to give that protection to you to our consumers. So we are, well work, we are working on that. And you will hear later on this year of a big project called Digital Transformation funded by the World Bank with our member countries. ECCB is coordinating that project in, coordination, in, con in, in collaboration with OECS Commission, CTU. And I see my colleague Imran Williams, a national of St. Lucia, where is Imran? Right. Uh, who is leading our ch the charge on that project for us at the bank. We take in young people and we put in them to work on big projects because we believe in the potential of our youth. Four, regional ANC transport. I almost want to skip that one because <laughs> where do I start and where do I end? But let me say this very briefly. Very briefly. I believe regional air transport Sea transport are regional public goods. What does that mean? In my humble estimation, some public support is required, but must be delivered in a fully transparent and highly accountable performance framework. The basic elements are, one, a negotiated basic route network, which serves as a bridge to connect our people. Basic network. Two, an agreement on the cross-subsidy of that network because some routes are profitable and some are not. And three, a commitment by governments for certain, for payments, fees for service for certain unprofitable routes. That's the core of the model that we need. And finally, a commercial disposition on matters such as procurement, HR, and finance. If we could adopt these four principles, we could solve this problem in the region. Similarly, so that's all I'm going to say, I know. Really? Yes. Time is out. We also need to get a fast ferry service. We are working on that, but it's, it's been proven difficult. The initial estimate for the service is the cost of the initial upfront cost is about 16.5 million US dollars for a ferry that would do, I think, about 400 people with 40 cars. Um, but the issue is, is, is making that investment so that the governments are not paying or having to pay recurrent costs because you realize what's happening with Liat right now. They're constrained. So we don't want to put anything before them where they have to find money that they don't have. So we're still trying to figure that out. And then we have to work on things like how you move from border to border. In other words, if, if you drove from St. Lucia to St. Vincent with your car, customs there can't charge you import duties. These things have to be worked out. Uh, but for this business community, we absolutely need that fast ferry service for trade. So it's something that we are committed to continuing to pursue. Finally, resilience building. Given our vulnerabilities, we have to invest in our resilience. And that is not a cheap undertaking. 
We believe that the resilience, that the CBI proceeds should be used for building resilience, and we also need to use climate funds, which have been promised under the Paris Treaty, but which have not yet appeared, to assist us in that regard. However, one area where we really feel that we could make a move real fast is in the area of renewables. And so what you will see is that at the moment, we are only doing about 8% of our electricity from renewables, solar PV, hydro in particular. Only 8%. Now, the sun is God-given. That's a natural gift that we have. And so, we believe that the region needs to be a lot more ambitious and aggressive in adopting renewables in its energy mix. But this is very important for a carbon footprint, but that's not the main reason, as important as that is. It is to lower the cost of energy for our people and for our business community. Because in many of our countries, St. Lucia, the cost here is about 30, almost 40 US cents per kilowatt hour. And therefore, that presents a real challenge for our small hotels, our businesses, for our households. You look at what you're spending every year in terms of importing oil, fuel. If you can reduce that cost, you can release those resources to do something else in the economy. Law enforcement, education, healthcare, and so on. So that is what we want to encourage. Ladies and gentlemen, here ends the outline of the Technology Enabled Strategy 2.0 for 2020 and beyond. It is broad in scope because our development challenges are great and diverse. And yet, it is far from exhaustive. And it is ambitious because our development challenges are formidable. As I close, permit me to switch disciplines for a moment to share a sober truism from Sir Derek Walcott's 1993 play, The Odyssey. And I quote, the future happens no matter how much we scream. End of quote. The reality today is that we live in a digital world and there can be no transformation without digital disruption. We cannot stop the tsunami of technolo technological change, but we can stop the realization of our dreams if we are stuck in time and slow in our embrace of digital transformation. Do we have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? What's it? What's the mindset? Let us proceed with nowness and boldness to secure our place in the global economy for our children and grandchildren. May Sir Arthur's legacy continue to inspire us to pursue excellence for Caribbean people and civilization. I thank you. Inequality is a global challenge. And in a sense, a lot of what we see now in terms of some of the inward-looking policies of our advanced economies is really a pushback on globalization. But I look at how technology is also empowering us. Yesterday, we had a very lively discussion on Airbnb and its emergence in St. Lucia. We told that there are about 3,000 rooms here now, and it's growing. And there are implications, some positive, some negative, or which we need to consider. It's impact on housing and so on. But the reality is that more and more of our people are now in a position to benefit from the gig economy by being able to put rooms, homes, up for rent via that medium. My point is that technology can enable more opportunity. And I think the key for us is how we allow it to be used to give more access to more of our people. I know our hotelier friends have concerns, and those are also genuine concerns. They've made big investments. But the reality is that that is a simple example of how more and more people can benefit. You look at Uber and how it has revolutionized, revolutionized the taxi industry. I remember being in the U.S. and at some points you can't get a taxi. You can't get a taxi. I would call. They see an overseas number and they refuse to take the call. They don't know the number or they think it's somebody calling to sell them something, a call center. Now with Uber, in minutes, you track it. And guess what? I don't need to have cash. That's the point. So I look at it 
I always have a half full view. I, I take an optimistic view. I recognize challenges. But the truth about it, if you think about our smartphones, you know, William, William Blake makes the point. What, was, what is now taken for granted was once only imagined. Think about the smartphone now and what that has done. And tell me which of us want to hand back our smartphone and go back with. <laughs> no. So uh, let us embrace the opportunity. Public policy must work to make sure that we are shared prosperity. And that's where we have to put our heads together to make sure more pe and more people benefit. The issue of growing the economy and government finances. In our country, for example, our middle class has been shrinking. And they're the ones paying the taxes. What would be your solution to counteract such? On the question of the middle class, that's a real challenge. And my view is that increasingly, we have to make sure that we target middle class in terms of how we... So again, I go back to the issue of access to credit. And I really feel, in a lot of cases, with these small businesses, if we are able to get the credit system right, we will help them out. And what most politicians know, but sometimes forget, is that every other person they see wants some money to do something. In a lot of cases, you need to have it. What you want is a system that allows that opportunity. So I actually believe that that is one of the things that we have to do for the middle class. The other area is, goes back to the issue of skills and employment. Because when you look at poverty, the, in a number of our countries, the number one reason for poverty now is actually not education anymore, you know, unemployment. And when you go back to unemployment, it is a lack of critical skills. So people are, we producing degrees for things that we don't need. I mean, it's amazing, no disrespect intended to management degrees, but the amount of management degrees that we have, and we have a serious management problems in this region. What does that tell you? And I'm not knocking anybody. In the point. Do you think that uh, Arthur's socio-economic principles have been acknowledged as much as they should be? If so, why? If not so, why? I, I think they have been acknowledged. I mean, the fact that 70 years on, we're still talking about South Africa, not just here in St. Lucia, but around the world. You cannot go to a development economics class and not talk about South Africa. His, his legacy is enduring. Now, like in any discipline, it evolves. So Sir so Arthur was a pioneer. He led the way. But we're supposed to develop what he gave us. And so my view is that his work is acknowledged. Um, there have been r debates about criticisms. The, the two biggest criticisms of Sir Arthur is one, the over-reliance on, 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 on foreigners and the over, overly generous fiscal incentives. That's the two major criticisms of the model. Um, and you hear that still. But I, on balance, um, feel that he has been recognized. What I want to make sure that our young people do not forget him. And that is why what you are doing this week and what you do every year in terms of the Nobel Laureate Festival is important. Because you can grow up with a generation who don't know who Sir Arthur Lewis is. And we must not make that, let that happen. This is why we have to do these things and perpetuate his memory. There was an old lady, her name was Sepulo. She never went to secondary school. I don't think she went to primary school. She could barely read and write. And she used to call us young fellas and say, Mama, I'll translate for you. The lady told us, we were young, young lads, and she, she, she used to say, all the land God made has already been made, and you can't make more land. So be careful we don't sell the land, especially those our parents and grandparents left for us, and gone by Motokan Mercedes Benz, or lease it, for 99 years for one dollar <laughs> and acre and talk talk that's say all we have is seawater and sand and some land these little islands are small islands i want you to speak to the 
leasing of land, some of our best lands, for 99 years for foreign investors. And these lands probably will never come back to us, we the people, in this region. And more importantly, these lands are leased without research, research, informed um, 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 statistics, especially in a growing population for them young people. Where are they going to build their houses? Where are we going to dispose our garbage? It's schizophrenic development. You know, it's like Tupama in Creole. Instead of doing research, bring the technocrats together. Where are we going to plan? Even the colonists, you know, slavery was well planned. That's why we stayed there long so long. And even after slavery, there was the indentured period. The fellas had a plan. These days, it's too born more anywhere. A fella come in his briefcase and he say he want that piece of land. And sometimes the best lands. It's like a man come in your house and say, I want your bed and your, and your bedroom. And we just give it to them. Speak to that, my friend. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you for the lecture and the education. Um, my 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 patois is only two bagay and sakitan parelot, so I can't offer more than that. Um, unfortunately, your grandparents. Yes, yeah. it is a serious issue, um, and it's it's a my my thing is that we cannot we have to preserve some land for our people. So whatever we do, we have to make a decision about about that. We must be able to preserve some land for our people. So there's a tension there. Because you do want to bring foreign direct investors in to make some of the big investments. But you certainly don't want to give away all your prime lands. And you kind of have to decide as a country what is your carrying capacity. You decide on what you will do and what you won't do. And have clarity about that, which is what you talk about with the plan and the power of the plan. Once you do that, it goes back to the comment I made about holding them accountable. Because what I, I detest, what I have a horror, is a situation where these lands are tied up for a long time. They are not delivering anything remotely close to what was promised. And we can't access them. That's a problem. And we have to be, we have to be in a position to give people shorter time horizons to recover those investments and to be able to, 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 to return the land. But in many cases, um, it is a tension, and I feel that you have to work out what you will do and what you won't do. So this area we prepare to do that, this area we're not prepared to touch. And you live with that. That's a trade-off you make for the patrimony, and you decide that is what you're going to do. People respect you when you take a stand. They may not agree with you, they may not like the position, but they respect you. That's all I can say on that particular one at this time. You emphasize the importance of the middle class. The digital revolution youth unemployment, youth unemployment. What is, the bank, what is the bank's vision, or what does the bank see as the way forward for youth entrepreneurship, startups in general? So we do doing a couple of things. First of all, we believe that the partial credit guarantee scheme, which is coming online this year, is intended to make credit available to small businesses, so young people involved, whether they're in cultural services, they're in agriculture, they're in tourism, potentially can have some benefit. The way the guarantee works is simple. A financial institution, your bank credit union, once you know, they are prepared to transact with the, the guarantee corporation, the guarantee corporation will guarantee 75% of the loan. So if the loan is 100,000, they guarantee up to 75,000, um, which means that what they stand to lose is 25,000. What that does is that incentivizes the institution to actually make the loan. In many cases right now, there are people on the periphery. Either they don't have a track record, they have no collateral, so they can't get credit. What that guarantee will do is give them a chance to, to actually get credit. And of course, you're not doing it for people to default, but in the event of a default, the financial institution will have resort to the guarantee. So that's one thing that ECCB is actually pushing. Um, the board is in place, the team is in place, and as I said, it should be, should be coming on stream this year. Secondly, we actually have been doing a lot of work with financial Because what we find is that, you know, there was a global survey that was done by Standard & Poor um, with George Washington University. Only one in three people understand personal finance. In the Caribbean, that figure is even higher. So we really have to educate people about money management. Again, I go back to what we're teaching. 
You, you got to come out of school knowing how to manage money. You have people with PhDs who can't balance a checkbook. You know, so that presents issues. And when it presents issues in the workplace, then you see unethical behavior step in because people are under financial stress and duress and they're starting to do things that they ought not to do. Or they're stressed out so their productivity drops. That's a real issue. The beauty of technology is that we can fix that now with apps and games. We can teach financial literacy. And by the way, you really need to teach that because if you give somebody a smartphone and they go on Amazon and they don't have any money management, God help us. You know what's going to happen there. <laughs> the other thing that we're doing is that we actually, every year, we've been doing two scholarships. I mentioned that, where we actually support two of our OECS students in the skills area. And again, what we're trying to do is to encourage more and more skills. Um, the skills that we need, the STEM skills. So the bank is, those are some of the things that top of mind I can point to. Um, you know, but obviously more needs to be done to support youth and to support the middle class in that sense. A quick point on your, your guarantee, um, yes. pro, um, yes. the intervention. We've been there already. Yes. The problem is not the money. Yes. The problem is the approval processes yes. and the understanding by the people with the power to make that load happen. Yes. Yeah. There's too much frustration on on the part of the entrepreneur. There's not the hand holding that's necessary, mm -hmm. and a number of things that usually end up with these schemes disappearing because of the frustrations. So I'm just hoping that you have that kind of, uh, well, the new approach, you know, to, 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 to the approval systems and, and the support that the entrepreneur must have to make that succeed. You know, it's true well, the loan is guaranteed, but people are still hesitant because they don't understand the true concept of entrepreneurship. Right. Yeah. Right. Thanks for that. And you're right, the history on it is mixed. We are aware of some of the challenges. We kind of looked at global experience, but we have to make it happen. And your point, your cautionary tale is, is, is appropriate. Thanks for that. This, as you said. Yes. And whenever we talk about South, a lot of people focus on his economics. Mm -hmm. Prescriptions. And in fact, his prescription for the development of those islands was not economic, mm -hmm. but political. In 1965, in his agony of the eight, when the, federa the federation broke up, mm -hmm. the little eight mm -hmm. called for federation, guaranteed good government, investment, rule of law, etc. Yeah. And he said if each island goes off on its own, its people will suffer. 1965. I want to ask you whether you don't think you, that prescription is still um, applicable, you know, the political union of those islands, in terms of their development. Well, politics is the art of the possible, and I'm not a politician. But my own view is that there are some fundamental regional public goods that we need to deliver. We have to connect people. We have to connect people. So rather than simply say, well, political union, which in my assessment, there's no appetite in the marketplace for that at the moment. <laughs> but we can take steps to deepen the integration. We've got to fix ANC transport. We have to have a single ICT space. We have a single banking space, single law, single regulator. We have a single security space, single or single regulator. We do not have that insurance in insurance yet. Uh, and pension funds, we need to do that. But in ICT, we have to do that. So increasingly, you make it easier and easier for people to travel, more and more people to people contact. And that in, in itself, I think, will get us closer and closer to where we have to be. At the end of the day, it will happen because people demand that it happen. But at the moment, there are too many obstacles for the people integration, goods, services, business, and so on. So I would focus on that right now. At the banking system level, the banks are coming together, shared services. We had talked years ago, so Dwight, my predecessor, God bless him, a blessed memory, great man. He was pushing to get the banks to come together. Um, he managed to get a couple of them. There was, some res there was some resistance. My approach is fundamentally, I believe in consolidation, but at this moment, shared services. So for example, the 12 indigenous banks that we have, We've come together and we are pursuing a risk and compliance um, service. Just like what Scotia had, which was the most profitable bank before it exited. 
come together centralized and spread the cost across all of his 19, 20 the jurisdiction. We need to do that for 12 banks. So I'm taking a practical approach to it, but I've not lost my, I, my sight of the prize. I still keep my eyes on the big prize. Thank you. I'm, I just want to plug in, please, no sharing of the mic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Governor, I must say that this is one of the most intriguing lectures that I've attended, the Sir Arthur Lewis lectures, and it's very um, in tune with what is going on. So we were definitely able to relate, at least I was definitely able to relate to everything. Um, I like the point that you made where you referred to our ease of doing business and you highlighted what is bringing us down. And I think that is critical. I don't know how much we pay attention to it. The central bank is already doing their part with regard to the credit bureau, which is coming on stream. However, from a national standpoint, we need to do our part. And St. Lucia, unfortunately, is, has the worst foreclosure legislation, I believe, in our region. And uh, if that legislation remains the same, then that point that you highlighted about getting credit, the ease of getting credit, will not improve in a hurry. And that will continue to frustrate our small businesses, our large, our personal, the individuals, everybody will be affected. Yeah. So I like the way that you made the correlation and I hope that our persons inside of here who have control over this area can see how Senusha can benefit if we address this part. Thank you for that and in the last three days while we were here, well four days, uh, we did share that with cabinet, the opposition leader and his team, banks of course, civil society. So we've been trying to get everybody on the same page in terms of the message and the issue and try to get a coming together, a meeting of the minds on the need for, to do this for St. Lucia. And by the way, St. Lucia accounts for 25% of the ECCU economy. So if St. Lucia grows, that means the ECCU grows even faster. So I, I'm rooting for St. Lucia as I'm rooting for the ECCU. We need to make that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor, for a very stimulating lecture. I don't know if I should call it a lecture or a speech, but um, it's a hybrid of both. Um, I want to ask you, um, what are the views of the central bank on foreign direct investment? And the reason why I'm asking this question, it is because I'm seeing more and more from a, I'm a St. Lucian, so I'm talking from, purely from a St. Lucian perspective. I'm seeing more and more institutions like the NIC, the, uh, National Insurance, and National Insurance in particular, but earlier on, a local bank was victimized by so-called foreign investors coming in and borrowing the domestic savings of the country. And that was before your watch. And one of the banks almost floundered by a substantial defalcation in, in, in its loans portfolio on account of this. The point I'm making, should not foreign direct investment be what it has always intended to be? overseas funds coming in through investors uh, to stimulate the economy, provide employment and training for local nationals. This is not happening. What is your view on this modern application of foreign direct investment? That's the first one. But a second one just put the, with which I would like to respond to the lady there and the question of the slowness of foreclosures. This is a fault of the judiciary, the fault of our courts. St. Lucia subscribes to what is called the hypothecary obligation, which came into being as a result of the Treaty of Paris of 1814, where the citizen was, was to be protected against himself. Don't forget, you had the English taking over from the French and the French citizens re remaining in the country. That right, we have enjoyed it in perpetuity. Why should we lose it? If a bank make a mistake or they were reckless in lending, why should they be able to come and just seize my property without I having the right of redress? We do not follow the rule of the English law of property. 
we follow the hypothecary obligation, and that's as a solution national. I will protest any change to the hypothecary obligation. Uh, well, I think the last one is spoken for. There's nothing I can add to that. Um, that was a declaration of intent. Um, what, what I will say is that um, on the first issue, the bank has to assess the risk. I, I mean, I think, you know, the thing about it is that banks have to loan money. They have to do so prudently because they have deposited funds. And a foreign investor should bring some money, I agree, but I, I, don't, I don't necessarily feel that they have to bring all of the money. Because they look at the banking system, they see excess liquidity. The banks also want to make a loan. They, they, you know, they're in the business of doing that. So ideally, it should be a combination. I think I would have a problem if you come with no money and you're borrowing all of the money local. Right? But if you, if you come with a combination, you say, well, I, I, bring, you know, I bring 10 million, I borrow 5 million, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I mean, if you're making the investment here, which is what you're doing, that investment is going to stay here, you know, I, I could see that happening. So I, I think it's just making sure that the investor who comes has some skin in the game, an appropriate level of skin in the game, which means an appropriate level of exposure, um, so that they're not zero risk almost and that the bank or local institution is fully exposed. But I think we have to allow. And glo you know, capital is global now. So you know, it, it's difficult to you know, ring fence it in that way and say, well, this is solution money. Don't touch it. You, know, you have to come with, with your American money. So I would, I, would cautious, I would be cautious about saying they can't find that balance. And at the end of the day, it is still up to the institution to do a proper risk assessment when they're making that credit decision. That is on the institution. I will only say, I, I promise I won't go back on it, but I will only say on the last one. I discovered in one of my trips here, visits, that while we are protecting people, especially the primary uh, residents, the home, I discovered there was an individual who was owing the bank for 15 years, refused to pay, and was merrily adding on to the home. How do you explain that? And the thing that worries me about that is that it might be your money or my money that they borrowed. And when I go, I expect to get my money back, as do you. I don't think the banks are only, full, always and fully responsible. I think it's usually a combination. Have, 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 have banks made bad loans? Yes. But it's also some about bad pay. They're, they're that, absolutely, I know that. There's a difference between can't pay and bad pay. And that case I just shared with you was bad pay. That's the problem. So we have to make sure we don't incentivize that bad behavior. But that's problematic. Thank you. Tim, I apologize for the question I'm about to ask you. Um, but... A lot, of what you, a lot of what you said, in fact, I'm happy you started off by kind of muttering under your breath that the prime ministers, most of them are ministers of finance. Um, you didn't dwell on that too much. But really, this question speaks to political will and political competence. Because many of the things you spoke about, to me, at the heart of it, the condition precedent is political will and political competence. Um, changing the electoral model so that you have proportional representation. Changing the constitution so that you have a constitution that is modern and that is reflective of the times in which we live. Fiscal responsibility, public sector transformation. Resilience, yet we speak of resilience, yet we allow development or we pursue a development model that is anathema to the sort of resilience that we're trying to build. Yeah. To me, the common factor in all of this is either political incompetence or, polit or political unwillingness to do the things that need to be done. So given the very sensible, practical, um, and necessary prescriptions that you've given to us today, and I, I thank you because it really was enlightening, how do we deal with this huge elephant in the room, which is political class that is resistant to change and that wants to protect its status quo because that is the most comfortable way for it to survive. The demand has to come from the people. Politicians respond to that. That's their ultimate bosses. So when I, when I push for fiscal responsibility legislation, the pushback I get from some quarters is, okay, one is tying my hands, but the second issue is that any government can go to parliament and change it. Now, by name, in 2011, I called in Grenada for that to be put in the constitution. Of course, some people laughed at me and said, well, that's mission impossible. Some people empathized with me but said, well, I don't see that happening. What we got in the end was in law in 2015. 
You don't always get what you want. And when you want it. But we made an important step. Now, my response to those who say, but any government can go and change this, is that if the people are sufficiently sensitized about what this means, then they are going to be the ultimate guardian and custodian of that law. You know, in Germany, a government cannot go and be fiscally reckless. Because deep in the psyche of the German people, they understand after the difficulties in the 1930s with stagflation, they understand, they understood and still understand that governments must always keep the fiscal house in order. So the debate in Germany is more about how much of the surplus to spend, which is a good problem to have. But what they will not allow any government to do is to one will be reckless and just spend the money. In our region, what we hear sometimes, and I'm being frank, real people really sues. People say, well, boy, I hear your governor, but what do you want me to do? Leave the money in the treasury for the opposition to come and spend it when they get in? <laughs> but I'm saying the way we deal with that is that people have to embrace that and understand if that doesn't happen, I'm going to pay more taxes. I'm not going to get protected in a downturn because my government will have no space to respond. To me, that is something our people will have to deal with. Great. It would be great if there's a night leadership, and I, and I, I, I encourage that. Um, some of our governments have said to me they are going to do it, so I'm going to obviously continue to press. But I feel part of the incentive also needs to come from the populace who understand it is in a long-term benefit to have such a regime in place. So that's all I'll say on that for now. Thank you very much for an excellent um a performance. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to um, come on the question of the uh, foreign direct investment. At the time that Sir Arthur did his industrialization of British West Indies, the question of savings was low. There's a 5% saving rate at the time. And he did say that if you go up to 15, then you're right. So ch things, things have changed. And in fact, our savings rate has gone up. Having gone up, you have the capital. So perhaps what we need to do is get our local people to give them the same incentives that you give to the foreigners. And you do just like, in, in, well, Zaf was familiar with what they call the development areas in Britain at the time, and shift it locally rather than bringing in the foreign investors. That's one. Second one is that Sir Arthur, when you look at Sir Arthur's writings, people just take them in parts and not go through the whole thing. For example, the question of knowledge it was not a question of just inviting people, but the question of inviting people and training them over a period of time. And the countries, the countries in the world have actually have used uh, Sir Arthur's model. And Japan is one. And China is the other, particularly in the case of Japan, where the knowledge, the question of the knowledge base has been doing, and then they, they utilize it and modified it, especially, for example, in the automobile industry. So I just wanted to make those points that uh, in terms of looking at exactly what Arthur did, but giving him his full uh, kudos yes. in understanding the thing. The other thing, the, 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 the criticisms, for example, like Lloyd Best and so on, making Papi show with the man, uh, about you calling him an Anglo-Saxon and all that. Um, he, in his own plantation economy model, and the one by persistent perform, per, per, um, performance, are actual continuations of Sir Arthur's model of the dual economy. Thank you. Well noted. In a world where research is showing currently that M-Pesa in Kenya and similar institutions for the unbanked are having creating problems for the unbanked, could you clarify the end of what you were saying about the uh, digital Caribbean dollar, um, that it would work for the poorest of the poor? I'd like to know how, because they're not in this room to ask that question. Thank you. All right, so the way I 
the way we see it is that they are the ones who pay disproportionately more of their income on payment services. So, no, but whether it's remittances that they're getting, whether it is transfers that they have to make, money is coming out of what they receive. But the point is, you want to be paying less for services. In other words, to my mind, a dollar for a poor person is more than a hundred dollars for you, perhaps, or me. I want to make sure that most cents of that dollar stay in their hands. That's the value proposition. So we want to do something that touches people where they live. And the truth is that payments are the lifeblood of the economy. So if every time you swipe, somebody takes 3% or 5%, it, it adds up, it adds up, it adds up. So that's what I mean in that sense. So maybe I wasn't particularly clear, but hopefully it's a little clearer in terms of why we feel that that will help. So after Lewis Community College, you have a nice logo. I like it, and I think we should congratulate you on it. This was just a little aside. Do you know, Mr. Antoine, that I now have to bless you rather than curse you, and I'll tell you why? Going to the bank, you said that the bank is very liquid. They have a lot of money. Why then do they continue to take from us every month and there seem to be no policy among the various banks. Some take $25 a month, you know, from the little kakada we have there. Others take $2. I noticed they brought it up to $3. No, this is very important because our savings are being eroded every month. And if they have all this money, they should be giving us more <laughs> interest. I feel like if I just received a delivery on a pitch keeping low. And um, let me hand the mic to Dr. Lacobin. Eh, uh, listen, it's. <laughs> No, so let's very, very briefly. The law does not allow ECCB to step in and tell them no, they can't raise it. Don't have it. Oh. So a lot of time people ask us, why don't you step in? What the law allows us to do at the moment is ask them, why? Show us your justification and give the customer at least one month's notice. That's really what we have in law. Now, we are discussing a couple of things. So in the meantime, what we did is we published on our website all the fees, or at least a bundle of fees, in each country. If you go on the ECB website, you will see the banks in the country and their fees for certain services. We did it as a service to the customer so you can sort of compare and contrast and kind of help you with choice. Secondly, we're looking at a Canadian model for what services can be no fee or low fees. Right? Maybe one account is exempt and another one and other multiple accounts. Um, you know, you may, you, may, you may be charged something, but senior citizens. We've been looking at a few models about how we can kind of protect people. Because that is a real concern. And I will tell you the monetary council, every, almost every meeting, the ministers come very annoyed about that issue that with the banks. Now, having said that, I do have to say on the bank side that the banks are under pressure as well. Yes, they have a lot of money, but it's your money and my money deposits. They don't own it. They have it in trust. So they have to handle it with care. And a lot of the pressures that the banks are under are a combination of higher compliance costs based on imposition from overseas, like the global FATF, OECD, and so on. That's why it's so hard to open an account now. Yes, and they're asking you all sorts of things, and every two years, you have a year, you have to go in and I go through the same thing because I'm a customer as well. Uh, but the compliance costs are real. And, and so our response to that is to bring the banks together and say, let us do shared services so we lower those costs. And our hope is that when we lower those costs, some of that benefit is passed to the consumer. 
the last thing I'd say is that I'm looking for some kind of consumer protection agency or function in either the ECCB or in an alternative uh, body. And we're discussing three or four options. So that they can take complaints and address some of the market conduct issues. Right now, we're not in law allowed to do that. But we understand that this is a, a particular problem. Big one that we need to try and come up with an appropriate response. What what we, I did say last thing, what the, the, the other thing is that we, because the banks are different and the models are different, you have to be a little careful. So you can't in law legislate fees. You can give some protection, but you have to be a little careful because one bank's model may be different for another. If a bank, for example, is doing a lot of digital services, their, their, their fees are likely to be lower than say a bank that's not doing. Right? So we say to the bank, certain services should be free. And if the customer insists on other things, then they pay. So, for example, you go for a statement. The, the bank should be able to tell you, we send you the statement by email. If, however, you insist that you want a hard copy, you pay for the hard copy. That's an example of, a, you know, of what we will ask the banks to do. But we fully hear you on that. It's a big issue. Governor, I would like to ask about the partial guarantee scheme. You mentioned 75% being guaranteed. Will there be a ceiling in terms of how much somebody can, how much that 75% will be in terms of the maximum amount? They are still looking at the numbers, but I know initially they were going small and they were thinking, looking at 300,000, but they were looking to see as well what the appetite in the market was, what the need, demand was. But I think the number they were looking at was up to a max of 300,000 initially. Okay. The other thing is, how soon would that partial guarantee scheme come into fruition? So the hope is that it would be this year. Uh, the board is in place, the team is in place, uh, you know, the members of staff, they are, they've got a little setback. They were hoping to get their portal launched last year. That got a little delayed. But they have assured me that they're going to be in the countries. They're starting with a roadshow early this year. So I am holding them accountable in that sense. And finally, the credit bureau that you spoke of, can you give us an idea of the status, where it's at, and how soon we expect it to be implemented in the ECCU? So here's the thing. Um, five of our countries have passed the law. So we now lo looking to St. Lucia, Dominica, and Anguilla to do that in short order. I've been assured that it will be done, but we do need it to be done. And I will tell you a little secret. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> The credit bureau operator wants to open the headquarters here in St. Lucia. So you need to pass the lawsuit. <laughs> now, once that is done, what we plan to do this year is a massive public education campaign to make sure people understand. And then, and by the way, we hope credit unions will also benefit from it. And I want to make a point. Credit bureau is not to block credits. It is to enable responsible borrowing and responsible lending. It's to assess and the price risk. Why should I be paying 10% if I could pay 6 but I am paying 10 because they have no records on me and they deem me to be high risk. Yet I'm a good credit, but they don't have my information. And why should they give you another loan when you're owing Tom, Dick, and Harry a loan? You shouldn't get another loan. So it goes both ways. And I want to be very clear about that. I'm not selling anything and hiding anything. No false advertising. Responsible borrowing and responsible lending. It goes both ways. So people with genuine credit, good credit, will have opportunities, more access, and lower price. And if you have bad credit, then you don't need another loan. Something that you mentioned concerning the youth and financial management in schools. We had a, prin a former principal who was always advocating having economics in school as a compulsory subject. And that's something I really wanted. I did economics in school too. But um, the young people today are very reckless in their desires and their spending and their priorities when it comes to paying back. Now, you did mention that that is one of the, the downs in um, the whole financial um, banking system here, the bad loans, payments, people not having good credit ratings, and so on. How do we instill that in young people curbing the desires for wanting things, a lot of things now, right now, and instantly, and 
I'm sure you mentioned also that your, your mother was a teacher. So you were, probably weren't born with a spoon, a silver spoon in your mouth. I was not. So learning to curb your desires. And if you want that sports car now, you don't, you're not going to get it right now. You have to sacrifice. You have to save and so on. There are not many people speaking to the young people today about sacrifice and hard work and getting there steadily it will come if you do certain things and not just, you know, the um, gratifying themselves instantly getting what you want all the time. So is the bank going to put something in place that you have entrepreneurship, junior entrepreneurship um, schemes and so on? With that, is there going to be that um, education of those people, those young people, in prioritizing their spending and wants and desires and so on and being patient? Yes, so we're, I've asked the team that did Financial Information Month to come back to me with some, some ideas on how we can make this a grassroots movement in the ECCU. Really feel strongly about that. At the end of the day, financial freedom can be achieved regardless of the income that you have. The fundamental principle is not how much you earn, it's how much you spend. And a lot of us don't get that, and not just the youth. A lot of us don't get that. A lot of us don't get that. You know, when I tell young people, here I was in the Ministry of Finance, taking a bus, so before I got married, I had a student loan, and I said, I'm not going into that marriage with that student loan. So I make that a priority. So before I buy a car, I'm going to pay off the loan. I'm not going into marriage with a student loan. And I was taking a bus. And people were like, you're working in Ministry of Finance, you have this and that, you're taking a bus. I paid off the student loan. And then I got married, senior economist, and I have a used car. And people... And then I became PS, and I was still with a used car. A man like you driving that? <laughs> but I had decided that I wanted to have my home before I was 30. And I had decided that I was not going to be any and every loan I've ever had in life. I've paid off well before the time. Because I understand that I save money and help myself if I pay it off early. So I've committed to those things. Now in doing that, I have had to forego certain things. But I have certain goals. So I, I try to teach that to young people. For the entire evening, I've been hearing speaking of two words, productivity and competitiveness. But also, those two words have another two meanings that we are not even talking about the persons. We're talking that we, we want to be competitive and, and, yeah, and productivity. The problem we have, we have people on a diet of two ingredients, blood and starch. The starch that we eat is mostly wheat, and the wheat, they put uh, uh, an extra protein in it that they call it lectin, and that is causing serious problems with people, and people are always sick. With their stomach, they have stomach problems, gut problems, and people are always sick. How can those persons be competitive and productive? When you have that situation, the healthcare is in a mess. Nobody is doing anything about it. How can these people do the work that they need to do to make the country productive and competitive? The, the last question. <laughs> what, what I will say is this, sir. You need to be appointed as a health ambassador in this country. Because here's the thing, government is pursuing national health insurance. It's important, but it's a very expensive proposition. I mean, that's a fact. And critical to a sustainable national health insurance is going to be primary health care, prevention, healthy and active lifestyle. Some of the issues that you talked about in terms of nutrition and so on. A lot more of that will have to be done because hospitalizing people and hospitalizing people and then trying to get them well. Expensive and sometimes ultimately not effective. So your point is well made and I think we need to see more of that 
even as we produce health care. In other words, health insurance is not a panacea where, you know, I could get sick and it's like somebody say, well, I pay for insurance so I could go and bounce the car. You may not survive the accident to collect the insurance. You see what I mean? It's a protection, but you don't want to really have to use it. So that is where we need to put a lot of emphasis. And I think you, you are on that track and hopefully some of your views can be heard and, and used. Thank you. Thank you.